Welcome to lecture 12, <clears throat> understanding data. Last time we talked about recursion. Uh, recursion is a function is calling itself, basically. And I, I hope you did some practice after the lecture so that you get the point. Today, I will be talking about data science, a little introduction, not too much, and some important Python libraries, pandas, numpy, matplotlib. Again, our goal is not to teach you Python programming language, but I wanna make you familiar with the capabilities of Python. And you are going to do your, probably the first data science project, a machine learning project. Uh, what is data? It's a factual information, right? Uh, there are several definitions of that. There is a lot of data around, but you need to make sense out of it so that you can convert it to some kind of value. Data science is a study of data. It involves developing methods uh, of recording, storing, and analyzing data to effectively extract useful, useful information. So that is the point. There are a lot of data around. It only makes sense if you extract some useful information out of it. The goal of data science is to gain insights that is called insights and knowledge from any type of data. Who are data scientists? They are part mathematician, part statistician, part computer scientist, and part transporter. If you have these qualities, you may be a good data scientist. Uh, they straddle both the business and IT worlds. And today they are highly sought after and well paid. I mean, <clears throat> what we, consider data science is a sexy job, okay? Is it really sexy? Let's go to Google Trends. I, I created this, this, uh, these slides last year, so they are not really outdated, just one year old. If you look at the five, uh, past five years, you will see, you check the Google Trends and you will see the yellow one is data science. So a trend is rising, right? Okay. So the um, attention is getting bigger, growing. Maybe not, because if you add software developer, the red, uh, green line here, plot. So you see software development is still uh, more trendier than uh, data science. Maybe it is, because now I add Python here, okay? So you see software development is still green here. And Python, attention on Python is increasing. So you learn Python to, you know, probably do some kind of data science stuff, some machine learning stuff, or maybe some web programming as well, but uh, Python is not, is mainly for uh, data science kind of stuff, okay? Not quite sure though. Now I add Python, Java, and C Sharp here. So you see the green is Java, uh, so you see Python is uh, yellow. Attention is getting more on yellow at this point in time, 2018 maybe, I don't know. Uh, Python is more trendier than Java for the first time. No, not for the first time. Oh, it is here for the first time. In 2017, okay. Anyhow. 
If you look at the current trends, you see Python is more trendier than Java programming, okay? So more people are willing to learn Python. This is the translation of this. Why? Because everybody is talking about data. If you look at these, some important uh, uh, journals or magazines, so especially, you know, the economist, economist tells the future. Uh, if you look at conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy theorists, uh, you will see they determine the future somehow. So, in the so our current time is about data. Probably coming decade is also about data. Uh, it will be more and more important. So why data science now? As I said, data becomes more uh, popular and more and more available to people. Uh, we produce data via sensors, for instance, temperature sensors, or some body sensors, surveillance cameras, browsing the web, sending emails, medical instruments. There are a lot of things. So every time when you visit a web page, for instance, you create a data about your visit that is also stored. That's why they are, you know, recommending they are recommending you several uh, products, goods, so that you can buy them. <clears throat> this is all about data science. The biggest data source we have today is internet. Uh, this figure is also belong to last year, but picture that did not change so much, except the numbers maybe are uh, bigger than what we have on the slide now. So if you look at, for instance, YouTube, in a minute, 4.5 million videos viewed, uh, almost 90,000 people are tweeting, almost 200 million emails are sent. I mean, the numbers are really huge. 18 million texts sent via WhatsApp. No, it's some other, uh, it's SMS, sorry. Almost 4 million search is uh, performed on Google. So you see the numbers are really high, huge. I mean, it's very difficult to cope with this sort of data. That's why we have special kind of computers for these that we call clusters. You will learn about them later in your education. But the thing here is data is so huge. It is so huge. That's why this uh, data science thing works, actually. So you try to get insights out of data is, is crucial as we want to, for instance, to build better football teams, sell more products, avoid fraud. Uh, find treatments, so on and so forth. You can find several other examples, application scenarios. Um, have you watched this movie, Moneyball? It's available on Netflix if you like to. Brad Pitt is the, the general manager of this Auckland AIDS. It's a, American, uh, it's a baseball team, sorry. And he's under budget and he's so passionate he wants to you know, win the championship, but he's under budget. What he can do is uh, he hires this nerd. His name is Pete on the movie. And this guy has major in economics. <coughs> Pete shows Billy Beam, Brad Pitt in the movie, that how he can analyze data about players so that uh, he can find undervalued uh, uh, players with less money. The Auckland A's picked players that scores thought no good, but data said otherwise. Okay. 
So if you look at the, the results of what they did, uh, so this is New York Yankees, I guess. So they paid more than uh, $150 million and they only win little over than 100 games, okay, average wins. But if you look at Auckland A's, they almost, they won almost the same amount of games, 100 games, let's say, but they spent one third what New York Yankees did. Okay. This is the result of data, uh, data science. Another example is data analysis in physics, Large Hadron Collider, I hope, I, I hope you heard about it. So this is this, there is this ring. This is the, this is underground tunnel, 27 kilometers long. Uh, there is a CERN, I, I hope you heard about it as well. So this is how it looks, the underground tunnel. And this is the technology they use. I mean, they, these are electronic stuff. Uh, inception level stuff. So uh, I was there once, I saw this stuff by myself. They try to, you know, basically prove that God doesn't exist. Uh, they spend a lot of money for that. But what is important for us is they produce 50 petabytes of data per year. Do you know what petabyte is? You have your hard disks, for instance, probably one or two terabytes. Petabytes comes after terabytes. So if you have thousand terabytes, that means you have one petabyte, okay? It's very huge. Uh, something famous also, Netflix challenge. This was very old actually, it's 2009. Netflix awarded $1 million prize uh, to these guys. These guys came up with some kind of algorithm to recommend you some kind of movies. Okay. Well, how it basically works is, um, you know, you watch a movie, later on another movie comes, pops up, or maybe there's another movie you never noticed. Netflix thinks, thinks that those movies are similar to each other and it recommends it to you. Or maybe another person is watching movies, kind of movies you like, and that guy watches another movie and Netflix thinks that you may be interested as well. This sort of stuff, okay? This is again about data. And you can also do more complex things like you can discover relationships. Um, let's say we have people about uh, A, B, C, D. <clears throat> A follows B, B follows C, C follows A, B, and C altogether follows D. What does this mean? This means D is an important person, right? Because everybody is following them. Let's say Aşçı, başçıvanı, başçıvan, şoför, şoför, uşağı, hepsi birden uşağı takip ediyorsa. This is a joke, but now you put some kind of semantics here. Now you will say, but maybe he's not really that important. Facebook bought WhatsApp for $19 billion in 2014. $19 billion, okay. Can you tell why? Because, it's because of the data they have. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, when you install WhatsApp on your telephone, the first thing it does is, is it downloads your address book. <laughs> then it creates a graph to see who is involved with whom, who is connected with whom, so on and so forth. It's very valuable, okay? It is very valuable. And at that time, just a side note here, WhatsApp had 55 employees in 2014. Currently, the number is little lower than 100. You see, uh, only few people 
achieve this huge thing. How do we do data science? Science, determining what questions can be answered with data and what are the best data sets for answering them. Computer programming, use computers to analyze data. Data wrangling, you get data into an analyzable form on our computers because maybe you do some kind of formatting, you know, I will give an example on that. And you need to do some kind of statistics as well. You need to separate signal from noise and machine learning. Okay. Uh, you try to make predictions from data. That is not enough. You know, so you do a lot of work, then you need to communicate your results so that others can see or, you know, understand it. I'm going to give an example on those. Let's talk about some important Python libraries, pandas, numpy, and matplotlib. There are other libraries as well, but these three are the, the most important to me. Okay. Pandas provides data structures and operations for data, data manipulation and analysis. NumPy provides means to work with multidimensional arrays. And Matplotlib, a plotting library used to create high quality graphs, charts, and figures. <clears throat> uh, before we continue, so as far as I know, in the exercises, you are using Jupyter Notebooks, right? OK, <clears throat> how we can do that? Uh, what you could do is you can go to Google Colab. You can create a new notebook here. So how do you work with uh, Jupyter Notebooks? Just for information, I'm asking somebody answers this. Use an Anaconda distribution. Okay. If you don't want to install anything, you can directly use Google Call App, okay? Uh, like you can say, print, hello. Uh, I also, I like, okay. okay, it is a little slow. So you can install it by yourself. I did, it's in the Anaconda. And you can simply execute this notebook. Let's see. It is here. Uh, where is it? You can simply uh, okay. Let's try to understand this code. Uh, let's clear all output. Okay, you know about Jupyter Notebooks, good. Let's continue with Pandas. It's a library that contains high performance, easy to use data structures and data analysis tools. Uh, data frame is the most important object here, a fast and efficient object for data manipulation with integrated indexing. And there are tools for reading and write, writing data in different formats as well. For instance, you can read from an Excel file. You can do slicing, indexing, subsetting, merging, and joining of huge data sets easily. 
Typically, you import pandas as import pandas as PD. This is a convention, but you don't have to do that. Okay. You can name it in another way. Let's get this uh, example. Uh, you import pandas as PD, then you have a data. It is a dictionary, okay? Name, these are the names. So, midterm, final, and attendance, these are columns, basically, okay? Name, midterm, final, and attendance columns. I'm going to use this dictionary to create a data frame. Okay. So I provide this dictionary as input to my data frame. And by using this constructor, I create this data frame, which is called df underscore dbm101. Now you can print the head of this data frame. Head prints top five rows. Let's go to the example. Let's try to execute this. Okay. Or you can print. Uh, I used here the print statement, but I can simply uh, print it like this. This is more user friendly, I guess. You can also say head 10. Of course, there, are, there is no 10 <laughs> rows in this, uh, in this data frame. Okay, um, let's continue with that. So you see, you have a data frame, rows, columns, rows are indexed by these integers. So basically, DB, DF BBM 101. Uh, I will go back to here, DF BBM 101. Zero. Will return nothing because I need to use lock. Okay. Rows and columns. This is a numeric key. Right. Okay, I just want to get the first row out of this data frame, okay? <clears throat> I will give you more examples on that. But here, what is important here is this is the index column. You see, uh, name, midterm, final, and attendance, name, midterm, final, and attendance here. And there is no really index column here. It is some kind of built-in. This is the same thing in another way. Now you have uh, names, midterms, finals, and attendances, uh, lists, separate lists, and you uh, put labels for these lists, and what you do is you zip them, okay? If you zip them, you will generate tuples, okay? You will generate these tuples and you can create a dictionary out of this tuple. Then again, you can create the data frame. It's basically the same thing. Just go over this slide by yourself. What you can do is, as uh, what else you can do is, uh, you can add a new column. Remember, there was no total column here. You can simply add df underscore total zero, which will add uh, 
right here. So it will add a new column and the values on this column will be zero. This is called broadcasting. Okay, you broadcast zero to all columns, all rows. You can also have computed columns, like uh, you can, you know, the total column you added or you simply add now. Uh, midterm times 30% plus final times 60% plus attendance times 10%. If you do that, like here, uh, remember the total is zero for the moment. If you do that, maybe this is better. So you see total column is calculated. If uh, I'm sorry, a great column is now we add a great column here. Uh, we, we do the calculations for totals, 67, 80.5, etc. And now we add another column called grade. Okay. Grade is another uh, computed column. Let's say if total columns value greater than 60 or equal to 60 and less than 70, grade will be D. Okay. Uh, you do the calculations for A, B, C, D, and it will be in the uh, data frame. <laughs> That's a good question, actually. Let me see. Uh, and, and... Okay, attendance is wrong. Uh, attendance. Okay, we do this. Now Erkut has hundred. Okay. Uh, Okay, I will revise this slide later, but the most important thing here, what will not make it if you miss just one more lecture. Okay, what else we can do? Uh, remember we have this name, midterm, final, six columns and three rows. What we try to do is we print name and grade columns here, okay? Here, what we do here, uh, what we do is all rows, slicing is same. So far you learn about slicing, it is the same. This means all rows and columns zero and five. This is again, all rows, columns, zero, two, three, four, five. Only true columns will be selected. If you execute this code, you will get the same result. These three statements will return the same results, okay? Let's say you have a CSV file like this. This is the uh, this is the CSV file, the content of the file. You can read this CSV file directly into a di data frame. This is a nice feature. Uh, let's try to find that here. 
Okay. And you can read directly result from the CSV file. You can also write it back. Okay. This is also possible. You see how easy to read data from an external file. What else you could do is here, if you compare these two, I will put it like this. So you see, it is an integer indexed data frame. What I want to have here is to, to index my rows by using the names of the instructors, okay? So still reading from the CSV file. And I say, use the name column as the indexing column. Okay. Do you see the difference between this data frame and this data frame? So in this data frame, you cannot access, I mean, you cannot easily access rows by using names of instructors. But here you can directly use names of instructors, instructor to access the the specific role, for instance, you can use the locate function to access FOAD, or you can access more than one instructors by using this list as the input. Okay, good. There's also iLock function. I'm not sure if I can, if I remember this correctly. Yes. So by using iLog, you can use the indices of a row, or by using the log, log function, you can use the index directly. It doesn't have to be an integer. Okay. Indexing data frames are really important. You need to go over this definitely. Okay. Another library is uh, NumPy. Okay. Remember we skipped uh, 2D, 3D arrays. When we talked about <clears throat> arrays. NumPy is a library uh, for uh, adding support for large multi-dimensional arrays and matrices, okay. along with a large collection of high-level mathematical functions to operate on these arrays. A NumPy array is a grid of values, all of the same type, okay? This is important. Uh, in arrays, all elements are of same type. In lists, it was different, you know? and is indexed by a tuple of non-negative integers. The number of dimensions is the rank of the array, like two-dimensional, three-dimensional, etc. The shape of an array is a tuple of integers giving the size of the array along each dimension, like n rows, I'm sorry, n rows, m columns. Uh, typically, it is important as import numpy as np, Again, you don't have to do that this way, but it's a convention. I suggest you use it. Like here, import NumPy as MP. You create an array of uh, three numbers and you check the type of it. It is NumPy and the array, okay? Check the shape of it. You see one dimensional array, it has three items, it's a vector, and if you want to print it, you print it, and you can access array elements by using indices. Good, this is very straightforward. How about this? This is a two-dimensional array, okay? If you check the shape, there are two rows and three columns, two rows and three columns. And if you want to print it, it will be printed something like that. So you see it's a matrix. Now what you can do is print 
B0, 0, 0, 0, 0, B0, 1, 0, 1, B1, 0, 1, 0, and this is the output. You simply use uh, indexes to access the elements of an array. There are miscellaneous ways to create arrays. Like you can say MP zeros two and two, which means an array of uh, two dimensional array, uh, two dimensional array, two rows and two columns, and all elements are zero. Okay. If you want to create a, an initial matrix, for instance, you can use this zero matrix, or you can say mp.1s, same as zeros. You can say mp.full. You fill the matrix with this specific number, in this case, which is, is seven. And you can say mp.i. You create the identity matrix, okay? So two, two by two matrix. And you can create a matrix of two by two in this example of random values. These are the random values that was generated and uh, at the time this comment executed. Okay. Probably every time you execute this comment, it will create another matrix. Um, let's talk about indexing arrays. Slicing similar to slicing Python lists. Uh, since arrays may be multidimensional, you must specify a slice for each dimension of the array. And slices are views, not the copies of original data. These are important points. Let's go over the examples. Let's say you have this array, uh, one, two, three, three rows one, two, three, and four columns. That is the shape of this array. So if you print it, you print it like this. Okay, let's try to slice it. So this is for rows, this is for columns, since we have a two rank, rank two array. Uh, we are selecting rows from beginning up to the second row. Second row, remember uh, the upper limit is not inclusive. Okay, uh, so we select first two rows. Columns, first column and second column, third column is not uh, included. That means you select this part of the matrix. Uh, you can say, okay, select, get me the uh, second row and all columns. Second row, all columns. Okay. Yeah. And get me all rows and all columns, but the last two. all columns, but the last two, it is here. <coughs> so you have to execute these comments and see the output of these comments by yourselves. It's always good to do more practice after the lecture. Integer indexing, NumPy arrays may be indexed with other arrays. Index arrays must be of integer type. Each value in the uh, array indicates which value in the array to use in place of the index and returns a copy of the original data. These are the important points. Let's go over the examples. More easier <coughs> to understand all the examples. An array, one dimensional array. <coughs> You select <coughs> uh, 
first, third and fifth elements, actually second, fourth and sixth elements, right? So this is here, that is that, and this is that. Now you create another array, one, two, three rows, two columns here, and you print it here. Okay. Now what you want to do is, you want to select print A, rows and columns. Okay. Actually this is translated to Zero, zero, okay. Zero, zero means this, okay. First, first, uh, up. and second, and Zero, second row here, and the first column is here, and the result will be one, four, and five. <coughs> this one, these two are the same thing actually. You can simply write A's, zeros, and z uh, first row and first column elements of A, second row, second column, third row, first column, okay. Both uh, notations are the same. Um, now what you want to do is uh, print 0011, zero, zero, one, one, uh, zero, again it is the same thing, 0 and 1, first row, second column, uh, second row, second column. I'm sorry, <laughs> sorry. First row, second column. First row, second column, they both refer to two, okay. Uh, this is actually the same thing. It, this may be a little confusing, but again, if you go over these slides and execute the code yourself, you will understand it. Um, let me see how many slides do I have here. Okay, let's finish this up to Matplotlib. Uh, there are Boolean indexing as well. You can use masks like Boolean array indexing lets you pick out arbitrary elements of an array. So this is also called mask indexing. You use a Boolean condition basically. Let's go over this example. <coughs> There's this array and you create a Boolean mask here, A greater than two. So this part, right? So what it returns is, it's a list of false and trues. So you see first two elements, the mask will be false. For the remaining part, it will be true. Then you can use this Boolean index to select uh, elements from the array. And if you, Boolean index, remember only the only these parts are true. And so this part will be returned. Or in a, in a shorter way, you can write it like this. This is the Boolean condition here. Instead of creating the mask in advance, you can use directly the mask here. A greater than two, select those uh, elements from the the array A. <coughs> <coughs> you can use some basic math. 
do some basic math by using MP arrays. Let's say you have two arrays, X and Y, two by two arrays. You can simply uh, sum two arrays. It is done element-wise. Uh, so if you add X and Y, one plus five will be six, okay? Two plus six will be eight. If you do the multiplication, three times seven will be 21, four times eight. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, will be 32. So uh, division and subtraction are done the same way. Uh, more examples, you can also do uh, inner product of vectors by using dot function. And you can get a transpose of a, a matrix by using x dot t if the matrix is called x. There may be several other functions, okay? You, you need to go over, uh, skim through the available functions in this library. What is that? NumPy. Okay, uh, matplotlib. Uh, Python 2D plotting library, which produces publication quality figures in a variety of hard copy formats and interactive environments. Uh, this is how you uh, import it. Import matplotlib.pyplot as plot, P-L-T. Again, this is a convention. Pyplot is a module of matplotlib which provides simple functions, okay? Otherwise, matplotlib is a very complex thing. So there is this pyplot module. You use it to draw uh, uh, charts on plots easily. There are many plot types like bar graph, histogram, scatter plots, area plots, pyplots. There are several of them, okay? Again, I'm not going to teach you these libraries in detail. I'm just going to make you familiar with them. Okay, why do we do that? Okay. Remember, we want to communicate our results easily. What is more clear than a picture? Okay, so first you do this uh, build visuals for exploratory data analysis. So, so you draw lines or you scatter plots, then you can see, for instance, some dots on the screen. They don't comply with the most of majority of the dots, for instance. Okay, so you can detect outliers easily, for instance, okay? and for many other things. And you want to communicate your data or results clearly. You want to share unbiased representation of data. So you provide a picture and you are looking at that. Some other people, uh, some other person is looking at that picture and, you know, uh, interprets it somehow. Okay. A picture is worth a thousand words. Make a simple plot. You import the library and you say plot dot plot plt.plot, five, 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 you simply put a dot. This is translated into this blue, blue dot. And this is the title of the uh, plot, uh, x label, y label, and this is to show the plot. Okay, it's a simple dot. You can make a line. For instance, this is our department's progress in the university entry exams. So you have years and lowest ranks, two arrays or two lists. Lowest rank is year is the x-axis, 
power strength is the y-axis, okay? For, so, these pairs, okay? And this is the title and the labels of the x and y axis and you want to show. Okay. So since you plot plot, and it plots this line. Okay, simple plotting. Uh, for the rest of this lecture, we are going to use a data set. It's the data set from the United Nations. Uh, for each country, there is an annual data on the flows of international, international migrants. Uh, let's work on data about Canada. Okay. You can simply access this file from this web page. It's also available on our courses web page. You can download it from there. Let's see if it is still there. Okay, immigration data on Canada as Excel file. And there's the CSV file I showed you in the previous hour. And there is some notebook here I will come to that. You can download this Excel file if you like, or you can directly access from this UN's website. So you see, it is something like this. So what you can see is the, you need to skip this 19 rows somehow if you want to process this file, or 20 rows. And these are the column names. You will see what is going to happen there. You can simply read Excel as a function of Pandas uh, library. And from this file, uh, this URL, this is the name, sheet name. So you see Canada by citizenship, Canada by citizenship. Skip rows 20, you skip the first 20 rows because data starts at 21st row and skip footer, there is some kind of footer, I guess, and you print the data frame. So it looks like this. You reach the data from UN's nation simply by uh, executing this command. Please try this after the lecture. And after the little, after little pre-processing, you convert this data frame, this data frame into this, data frame. So what is the difference? Uh, there is a new column called total. It didn't exist. And some redundant columns were removed. We only have now continent, region, and uh, dev name. Uh, area name became continent, for instance. Uh, region and what was the name of it continent region and their name we rename some attributes and we drop some columns like oh, sorry we drop this column area column reg column for instance and their column okay we drop this what else we did was we have this index column you see integer indexed now the index is the name of the countries. You may want to create this data frame by yourselves. It's a good practice. Now we can create line plots by using this data frame. Uh, let's say we want to <clears throat> uh, draw a plot about immigra immigrants from Haiti. Okay. So here on this data frame, we need to locate the row. 
where the country is Haiti, like here. GF underscore Canada that locates Haiti and get years, years. Okay. Then you can simply say, uh, you can simply plot kind of line and it will print back this, something like this. Okay. You go over the code, it's uh, fairly easy. And you can use area plots if you like. So you want to find the top five countries which send people uh, to Canada. Uh, you, I guess there's no surprise, India, China, UK. This may be surprising. Philippines, Pakistan, okay. Uh, then you can draw the result, what we called as, what is it? Area plot, you see, the kind is area. Okay. Actually, we are doing more or less the same thing with uh, line plots, area plots, I mean, similar things, of course, but the, the type of the plot changes here, kind is area, here, kind is line. You can also build histograms. For 2013, we print something kind of histogram. Okay, now the type of the plot is histogram. Histogram shows that uh, frequency, shows about frequencies, number of countries. Let me see, uh, in 2013, uh, what does this mean? I guess 5,000. It's not a good diagram, but it could tell me 175 of the uh, immigrants. No, I'm sorry. I guess let's call this uh, Okay, I will call it like this. Almost 5,000 of immigrants from 175 countries. Okay, we can say that. So, or oh, 10,000 of immigrants from less than 25 countries, so on and so forth. This is not a good uh, drawing. I must also revise that. I will take a note. You can draw bar charts. You see, it's a kind of bar now. So Icelandic immigrants, we are trying to look at that. For instance, in 1980, almost 20 people migrated from Iceland. So if you look at this, in 2013, almost 70 people migrated. So there's a recent trend, increasing trend here. Interesting. So you see, we are doing some kind of exploratory data analysis because <laughs> when we look at this figure, we see that there was some interest in 1981. It's kind of decreased up to 1990, then more or less stable. But after 2007, now we see another trend uprising. You can use pie charts, like kind is pie now. Immigration to Canada by continent. Uh, of course, in this case, you use totals here. And there's some uh, method called group by. Please just uh, go over the manuals to understand this. It's basically grouping the numbers by sum. So it's like uh, it gets the sum of uh, immigrants from Asia, Africa, for all the continents, basically. It groups by continents and then provides a pie plot here. 
So we see most of the people from Asia. So there are several other probably uh, kinds of uh, charts, but this, uh, I just want to make you, as I said, acquainted with that. Before I close this part, I want to say something about charts. Um, you know, uh, there's this dark horse and out this is a company. You can check its websites about designs, charts, etc. Uh, they claim less is more effective, attractive, and impactive. Let's look at this pie chart. Uh, it's about pig meat preferences. Chabe, chabe. Uh, so you see, 42% of people prefers bacon. It's a pie chart. I don't know, do you like, if you like this chart? I don't. There's just too much colors. Uh, it's very difficult to read and so on and so forth. What we could do here is we could remove the background. More, it is more readable, I guess. What else we could do? We could remove borders. We could remove redundant legend. We could remove 3D. We could remove text bolding. We reduce color. We remove edges. Instead, we take on lines, emphasize bacon, and now you compare. So you see, this is the, the less, this is the more, and I guess less is better as compared to more. And another thing about pie charts is, pie charts are not really uh, preferred, okay? Just keep this in your mind. They are difficult to read if the slices are so close to each other. Let's finish this part with uh, your first data science project. <clears throat> In this project, you will try to detect breast cancer, okay? Based on the given data, you will predict if a cell is benign or malignant. Before that, let's talk about machine learning a little bit. So, there is the cell. The question is, is this a benign or malignant cell? For this cell, you have this information, this data. These are some lab results, whatever. We are not interested in that. So basically, for every patient, these are the patient IDs, we have this data and Let's say we have this data and this patient goes to falls into benign class. This patient is malignant, so on and so forth. What we want to do here is, uh, can we make, can we find a pattern to distinguish patients malignant or benign, okay? To do that, <clears throat> so we do some analysis basically. Uh, and that shows that many of the characteristics differed significantly between benign and malignant samples. Then we built a model and we use those characteristics or model to predict a newcomer. So this is a new patient, you see, the diagnosis is not done yet. Maybe by looking at these, this data, we can say this patient, uh, this cell is benign or malignant. This is called prediction. And we do some prediction our prediction might say it is 89% benign, okay? Uh, the prediction comes with some kind of probability, of course. Nothing is certain. So uh, machine learning is the subfield of computer science that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed, okay? 
So let's say there, there are these pictures. You want to know if there is a cat on this picture. How can you do that? If you do write some program, for instance, you can say, uh, you extract some features from this picture, like, uh, let's call these features feature one, two, seven. You can simply say that. In your program, you can simply check if F1 is yes, and F2 is less than two, then it is a bird. You can simply say that if it has uh, four legs and one tail, it may be a, a cat. Okay. But you need to add several of those rules to correctly identify a cat. Okay. Uh, it is really complicated. It's not that easy. There are several different uh, animals and there are several different angles to take a picture of an animal. So it is very difficult. So you need a lot of rules. Instead, we try to extract features out of the pictures and build a machine learning model. And when we feed a, a search image to this model, it will tell us it is a dog or a cat or a fish or so on and so forth. So this is done without being explicit the program. You use available uh, machine learning libraries or algorithms to do that. Basically, uh, the model learns from data. Okay. For that, we have scikit library. There's another important library, SciPy, I didn't mention. It's about scientific uh, programming. You may want to look at that if you like. But here we are mostly interested in scikit-learn. It's the Python library for machine learning. So methodology for machine learning applications is very straightforward. You obtain data first, then you understand and clean and transform data if necessary, build a machine learning model, train test your model, and predict. Okay? These are simple uh, steps. How do you obtain data? You collect data by yourself. Uh, you can borrow from friends, generate synthetically, Google it, but there's always some privacy uh, uh, laws you need to comply with. Or you can find some free data sets on internet. For instance, this one, UCI machine learning repository. If you go there, there are several uh, data sets available. Uh, for instance, I go to breast cancer, Wisconsin data set. Uh, you can download this data from here. Uh, there is information about data, which is, which is called metadata. For instance, it says there are columns, ID and number. Uh, ID number. Dışarıdan çok gürültü geliyor. Şu an kafam karıştı. Şurayı bir not alayım. Bağıra çağıra konuşan tipler var. Okay. Şunu tekrar alayım. So you can find uh, free data sets on internet. For instance, this one, UCA, UCI, Machine Learning Repository. There are several data sets. You can, you can skim through that. Uh, but we are interested in breast cancer data. Uh, you can check the metadata about this data set, like 
Uh, the first column is ID number, second column is diagnosis, M means malignant, B means benign, so on and so forth, okay? You need to understand the data, data set you are trying to work with. Okay, then you get the data files directly. You can download them if you like, or you can simply access by using the URLs. The first step is to understand clean and transform data. For that, you need to determine important features, look for correlations, remove duplicated data, handle missing data, transform data when necessary, so on and so forth, okay? Then you build a machine learning model. To do that, you need to determine the type of the task at hand. It may be a classification, regression, or clustering and you choose a proper algorithm to build the model. As I said, these are all available already in the scikit-learn library. You don't need to do any programming about the, the uh, on building the model explicitly, okay? You simply provide inputs to some available algorithms or functions or modules. Then you divide your test, your data into test that train and test sets, typically 75-25 person split. So by using your train data, you train your model. With this test data, you test your model. And if the performance is not satisfying, you can tune your model by switching parameters, or you can pick another algorithm if tuning doesn't help then you predict and you find new data or unlabeled data to predict. Or uh, train instead of train test split, you can split your data as train test uh, and validate uh, groups. So it's typically not 100% accurate, right? Hopefully your model is accurate enough to catch problems as early as possible. Okay, let's go to demo. Okay, these are the uh, libraries you need to import, okay? We imported them. Then you can read the, obtain the data from this URL. And these are the column names. If you do that, you can simply uh, uh, print it. Yeah, head, let's say something like that. Okay, I will come to that. Let's try to uh, understand this data. This is the second step. You obtain the data, now you try to understand and clean and transform if necessary. If you look at the shape of this data, you see 569 rows and 33 columns. Let's look at the first five rows. Maybe first 25 rows might be better. Okay. So, so this is the ID of the patient, ID column. And this is the diagnosis. M means malignant, remember. Uh, B means benign. And some measurements about the, you know, lesion, whatever it is. Now, let's try to describe our data. This is another useful function of pandas. So it gives you count, uh, number of rows, basically number of values, uh, mean, standard deviation, mean, and this is the uh, quartiles and the maximum values. Okay. Uh, actually, there is this unnamed 32 column and there is no data here, you see, zero data. That means we can remove this column. We don't have any data. And the texture mean, let's go over this. Uh, for this measurement, for this column, standard deviation is 
the minimum value is for a 9.71, so on and so forth. So you try to get an idea about your data. Um, of course, there's this ID column. ID column has nothing to do with the prediction, okay? It's your national uh, uh, ID number, okay? It has nothing to do with this. So we can simply drop that column, okay? We can also drop the columns with no values, man. You can go over these functions or methods afterwards, okay? Now let's look at the shape. Remember we had uh, 33 columns before. Uh, now we have, where is it? 31 columns. ID column is dropped and another column I showed you this unnamed 32. Since there's no data here, the column is not necessary. It is dropped by this method, okay? Good. Let's visualize these diagnosis counts. So you see little over than 200 people or cells malignant. The rest is benign, okay? Let's see the real values. Value counts shows you the distinct values on a column. 212 malignant, 357 benign. Good. Of course, we have B and M. Machine learning works with numbers, okay? So we convert them to numbers. Let's say I want to convert M's to one, B's to zero, okay? I can do this by using this command. Good. And now I can check the file again. You see M's became one. Now we can look at the correlations, okay? df.core method returns correlations among all pairs, okay? Uh, for instance, there is a 0 0.7 correlation between area mean and diagnosis. So you see, you can say that area mean is a good feature to determine uh, diagnosis. But you look at this fractal, fractal dimension mean is a very small amount of correlation between this fractal dimension mean and diagnosis. Maybe it is not a good uh, feature to use in the machine learning. And let's try to find another good one. For instance, concave points underscore words. So this is a good correlation. So we can use that, okay? Uh, but, uh, if you look at here, concave points mean and perimeter mean, there's a high correlation between them. So that means these two are correlated with each other. So that means I can drop one of them as well. Okay. So the idea here is we try to reduce the number of features to the uh, minimal one so that the algorithm is not uh, it's not that complex. So we try to reduce the number of features. So we try to predict a diagnosis by using minimal set of features, okay? So this is called collinearity. So we can remove one of them from our features. I'm not going to do here, but I'm just telling you what we can do. Now we can draw a heat map. by using the correlation matrix. So you can draw this. Uh, you see, of course there's something. 
uh, smoothness. Yeah, this is a diagonal thing. 94% correlation between area SE and parameter SE. So I can remove one of them as well. Good. And by using this sort of heat maps, I can directly spot most important features, okay? This is another way of looking at data. So I try to, for instance, visit a diagnosis, let's try diagnosis, visit. Diagnosis. Mm, okay, diagnosis is not here. So, to the first column was the diagnosis. Okay, diagnosis I can also add it here. So, okay, the figure uh, screwed up. I don't know how to fix this right now. Probably it is, I need to move this, but I can tell you diagnosis is 78% correlated with uh, concave points mean, so on and so forth. By using the, the, I mean, dark color means it's more, it's highly correlated. I can simply support uh, those important uh, features. Then the next next thing is to build the machine learning model. Okay, you have x and y. Y is the prediction or target, what we call here. The target is the diagnosis column. Okay, we are trying to find ones or zeros. Uh, So you see from every line, only the first column. From every line, uh, all columns, but the first one, except the first one, okay? So you create X and Y. Let's see what it, X looks like. You see it's numbers now, and Y, ones or zeros, okay? Now we try to, Train and test split. So test size means 25% uh, for test, 75% for data. And then we do what is called scaling. This is important because, you know, um, basically a data about a patient is a list of numbers, right? If those numbers are not normalized, so you can screw up with the math because I mean, basically in a vector space, you try to find the uh, similarity among uh, dots or points. Uh, if the scales are different, your algorithm may screw up. Anyhow, it is by using min max scalar or standard scalar, whatever scalar you can you choose you can scale your data, okay? Did I scale my data? Okay. Then you can train and test your model. Here, I'm going to use random forest classifier. This is an algorithm from the scikit-learn library I, I choose. Uh, and I built this model, uh, I uh, trained my model, random forest classifier. These are some uh, parameters. What is important here is fit, model.fit. 
So you fit this data with these results into the model. Okay. So you basically try, you train your model and giving those training data and you want to get those training results. Okay. This is how you train your model. Then you can check if your model works fine. Now, uh, uh, actually this should be X test. Uh, no, this is the training score, sorry. So the training score is 99%, right? Uh, according to your training, you receive this result. 99% correct. Now you don't, you want to do some testing. To do that, you call predict method with the X test data set. So remember, you, uh, you trained your model by using X train and Y train data sets. Then you, pred uh, you do prediction by using the X test data set. Remember, uh, you have Y test data at hand available. But by using X test, you try to create another uh, array with ones and zeros then you will compare those ones and zeros with the Y test so that you can figure how successful your model was. Execute this. Okay, it says accuracy score is 95%. This is smaller than this. This is acceptable because here, you test your model with data you never seen before or your model never seen before, okay? The idea here is that your model can generalize to unseen data. And here the accuracy score is 95%. I guess it is good. Uh, there is precision and recall values. Uh, precision and recall, another measure of the... Did we talk about this last time? No, precision is how, how much of the returned items are correct. Uh, recall is the how much of the uh, correct items are returned. Okay. And F, F1 score is a kind of, uh, uh, sometimes accuracy is not good enough. Okay. Because data may be imbalanced or maybe some other reason. For that, we use something called F1 score. I don't remember the uh, formula for that. You can look it up. It's a combination of precision and recall. Okay. I suggest you go over this notebook by yourself. It is pretty straightforward. You get data. Uh, you make some transformations on the data then you build your model. Uh, you, I mean, you, train, uh, you split your data as train and test, and you build your model. Uh, then uh, evaluate your model, okay? Then you report the results of your model. Please do this uh, after the lecture or maybe over the weekend but please do this, it is very important. Let's see if there's anything on the chat. Okay, I don't see any questions so far, but if there's any question, I will try to answer them. <laughs> 